Hi, it's Katrina. Number 10. The Darkad. The Darkad have been guarding the soul of Genghis Khan for 800 years. As the story goes, when Genghis Khan lay on his deathbed, he called for a shamanic priest. The priest then performed a ritual known as Sindarin Hurkag. This was meant to capture a small piece of the great ruler's soul so that it could be contained forever in the mortal world. The shaman plucked a hair from the forehead of a camel, put that in the Khan's mouth, and then when Genghis Khan exhaled his last breath, a part of his soul was transferred to that piece of camel hair. At least, this is what the ritual entailed. Following his death, the shaman who performed the ritual and 1,000 of the dead Khan's most ruthless warriors were charged with protecting that small fragment of his soul for the rest of eternity. Almost 1,000 years later, they still are. These people are called the Darkad, and these days they believe themselves to be the direct descendants of those 1,000 guards. They have passed down the stories of the Khan of Khans for 36 generations. Their duty now is to guard the mausoleum of Genghis Khan in Inner Mongolia. But there aren't too many of them left. In the 1800s, the Darkad was a small tribe who lived in wooden structures where they housed the artifacts of Genghis Khan. But they were devastated by a plague outbreak and didn't really recover until the 1900s. By the 1920s, the Darkad had retreated to the Ordos Desert and there were fewer than 5,000 left. In the year 2000, a survey revealed there to be an astounding 16,000 people who identified as Darkad. But now, 22 years later, there are only a fraction of those people left, and there are only 100 of those legendary protectors still living to guard the Khan's soul. Number 9. Kukuteni Tripilian Culture The Kukuteni Tripilian Culture is one of the most bizarre earliest human civilizations. They were around about 7,000 years ago in Eastern Europe and were unusually advanced for their time. They made highly sophisticated structures, packed tons of people into their settlements, and practiced an organized system of governance. What makes them really strange is that every 60 to 80 years, they purposely burned down their settlements, relocated, and then built the exact same thing all over again. This Neolithic culture lived from between 5,400 to 2,700 BC and covered a vast area of about 135,000 square miles. This area encompassed much of Moldova, Romania, and Ukraine. They built their settlements about one or two miles apart, but why in the world they burned them down so frequently is still a huge mystery to archaeologists. And here's another shocking fact about the Kukuteni Tripilian. According to the BBC, excavations have proved that they could be the earliest people who exceeded a population of 1 million. That's almost unthinkable for 7,000 years ago. They practiced agriculture, harvested wheat, barley, and peas, and made fantastic clay pottery. But what possessed them to ritualistically burn down their settlements is just baffling. One theory is that it had something to do with their religion. It may have been some kind of symbolic ceremony involving the idea of death and rebirth. Some experts even say they may have done it as a way to rid themselves of evil spirits that had infested the settlement, like diseases. But the truth is that nobody knows for sure. Number 8. The Kingdom of Kamajin The Kingdom of Kamajin was surprisingly short-lived. They ruled only from between 163 BC to 72 AD, and were heavily influenced by the Armenians and the ancient Persians. They established themselves in Anatolia, located in modern-day Turkey, with their founder being Ptolemaeus of Comagene, a previous governor under the Seleucid Empire. But because the Seleucid Empire was in a major decline, Ptolemaeus used it as an excuse to declare Comagene an independent state and became its first king. Since the kingdom was located near the great Euphrates River and bordered on the other side by the Taurus Mountains, it became quite successful through trade. Merchants were forced to cross through the territory, which brought tons of goods from all over the world into their cities. The one monument which this great kingdom is known for is Mount Nemrut, a fascinating site covered in statues. It can be found at the very top of the mountain, 7,000 feet above sea level. It was built right near the end of the kingdom as the mausoleum for Antiochus I. 
The kingdom finally came to an end in the year 72, when the Roman governor of Syria decided he didn't like how wealthy and powerful Commagene was growing, and marched on their borders with a small army. The entire wealth of Commagene was then absorbed into the greater Roman Empire. Number 7. The Urdu Begis During the Mughal Empire, there was a fierce class of female soldiers known as the Urdu Begis. These women had the sole purpose of protecting the emperor and his harem. During this empire, which appeared in India in 1526, women were often famed for their fighting skills. For example, when the first Mughal emperor Babur rolled into battle against Ibrahim Lodi, he was accompanied by what was basically a vanguard of highly trained women from Kashmiri, Turk, Habshi, and Tartar tribes. They were feared by everyone, the royals, men, and were fiercely loyal to the king. To understand what was going on a bit better, we need to look at the state of female affairs during medieval India. The emperor always kept a massive harem of women, but they weren't all just to satisfy his carnal needs. Most of them practiced what's called parda, meaning they were concealed from their heads to their toes so that no man could behold their flesh. This tradition has been going on for centuries and was generally accepted by all the most noble families. So the emperor kept these women in a harem, which was a self-sufficient city of women that were completely off-limits to any men. And to keep these women safe in their isolated city, the emperor had his legion of Urdu Bejis, or warrior women, to watch over them. Of course, not only them, but a small army of eunuchs as well. Number 6. The Chavin Civilization The Chavin Civilization was around for about 700 years, between 900 BC and 200 BC. They are actually one of the earliest cultures in South America prior to the rise of the Inca. They made incredible artwork that survives to this very day, and most likely influenced all cultural art in the Peruvian Andes that came after. Like many pre-Inca groups, the Chavin had a large assortment of interesting deities. One of their most famous was the Staff Deity, who can be seen as the central figure at the Gateway of the Sun in Tiwanaku. This deity was associated with agriculture, and was usually depicted holding a staff in each hand. He would later become the Andean creator god of the Inca, Viracocha. What made the Chavin truly unique was their disturbing religious rituals, which involved everything from public bloodletting to human sacrifice. Their main religious site was Chavin de Huantar in the Mosna Valley, where over 1,500 people would gather to watch shamans take hallucinatory plants and then cut people open to siphon out their blood. And while the Chavin were eventually erased by the civilizations that came after, it was their system of beliefs which paved the way for all Peruvian religions up until the Spanish showed up. Number 5. The Rurikid Dynasty The lands of Rus were ruled over by the Rurikid Dynasty from between the 9th century until the year 1598. It was originally founded by the great ruler Rurik and his brothers. But after his brothers were killed, Rurik alone was left in charge of a massive region spanning most of what is now Western Russia, with his base of operations in the city of Novgorod. After Rurik died in the year 879, his son Oleg was the next in line to rule. One of his first actions was to take over the city of Kiev in what is now Ukraine. That became the seat of the Rurikid rulers for another several hundred years, up until the Mongol invasion in 1237. During the time the Rurikid ruled, the Eastern Slavic tribes outside their kingdom were forced to pay tribute in the ways of taxes to the Rus overlords, lest they be utterly destroyed. And because the Rurikid dynasty had such close ties to Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire, Prince Vladimir converted his people to Christianity in 988. It was through conversion that the Rus territory could expand. The whole region of Russia and Ukraine became quite the force to be reckoned with. The Ruri kids then inserted themselves into other royal families throughout Europe through marriage. This helped them to establish ties with royal houses all the way from Scandinavia to France. By the end of the 12th century, the lands of Rus were divided into a dozen different principalities. This eventually caused the fragmentation of the dynasty, since rulers started popping up everywhere and not everyone wanted to cooperate. Then, when the Mongols invaded, the already fragmented land was completely shattered. By the time the 14th century came along, the lands of Rus were much smaller. They had lost Kiev, 
lost their lands in Poland, lost Lithuania, and were forced to retreat to Moscow. Number 4. The Kingdom of Reged The Celtic Kingdom of Reged is extremely mysterious. It has its origins in the region between northern England and southern Scotland. The kingdom actually formed after Rome had already conquered most of Britain, but failed to breach the northern lands or destroy the people there. And so, a people gathered their strength together beyond the border of Hadrian's Wall. Their stronghold was most likely in what is now Galloway, Scotland, starting around 550. But the truth is, we don't know very much about these ancient people. We don't know their exact borders or even the royal genealogy, because according to tradition, the kings of Reged were all descendants of Cole Hen, known in folklore as Old King Cole. He's about as real as King Arthur, meaning he may have existed or he may not have. In the end, this kingdom rose and fell in the blink of an eye. Sometime before 730 AD, they were absorbed into the new and far more powerful kingdom of Northumbria, and much of their heritage was lost. We only know the names of three kings throughout their 200-year history. Number 3. The Huanca Civilization The Huanca first appeared in central Peru about 800 years after the Chavín. It's interesting to take a look at this ancient culture and see just how things changed between the first major religious peoples of the Andes to those who came right before the rise of the Inca. They didn't live in the exact same place. The Huanca occupied the small area around Lake Junín in the highlands and dwelled in fortified cities at the top of hills and mountains. Their main specialization was llama herding. In fact, for the first 400 years of their existence, they didn't even farm corn. They relied totally on their llamas. They only started practicing agriculture when their population grew to be so dense that it could no longer survive solely on llamas and through trading. Quite unlike the Chavín, the Huanca didn't focus primarily on religion. They also didn't build great monuments. They focused primarily on herding their llamas and building their defenses. They lived in small settlements of fewer than 50 buildings, didn't even plan their towns, and stacked their settlements close to one another. These were shrewd people who gave the Inca Empire serious resistance when they started their conquest and they were never completely subjugated. They even helped the Spanish put down internal rebellions during the first years of colonial rule, like the one led by Francisco Hernando Giron between 1553 and 1554. Number 2. The Illyrians Modern Albanians are more likely than not the direct descendants of the great Balkan people known as the Illyrians. These were tribesmen who showed up in the western part of the Balkan Peninsula in the year 1000 BC right at the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. For the next thousand years, they inhabited most of the region. The Illyrians domesticated horses, learned how to fashion iron and bronze swords, and ended up migrating as far as Italy. In fact, the Illyrians spread their seeds everywhere. Some historians believe even the Macedonians had some roots with the Illyrians, and the Thracians definitely had some major Illyrian blood. But these people were different in that they didn't really construct giant cities or anything. They were tribal, living much like nomads and operating under a chieftainship. They had a council of elders, but were shockingly primitive for such a large group. They even learned how to build boats and turned to piracy on the Adriatic Sea. One of the only Illyrian tribes that actually formed some semblance of a kingdom was in the 5th century BC. A population established itself in what is today Slovenia and began populating like rabbits. They soon had established quite the settlement, complete with feasts, ritual sacrifices, and sporting events. But like everyone else in the 4th century BC, the Illyrians were conquered by Alexander the Great, and after that absorbed into the Roman Empire. But they never really lost their independence. The Illyrians just kind of retreated deeper and deeper into the mountains as Rome deteriorated. They eventually, according to historians, became the ancestors of the Albanians. Number 1. The Vijayanagara Empire The Hindu Vijayanagara Empire was founded in the year 1336 and went on to last for over two centuries. They dominated southern India, which was impressive considering they started as nothing but a community of cowherders. They would ward off Islamic invasions and managed to subjugate nearly all of the ruling families in South India, even pushing out the old sultans. 
The empire grew to be so powerful and influential that they attracted travelers and adventurers from as far away as Europe. Unfortunately, they were smashed by the medieval Indian Deccan Sultanate, made up of five individual kingdoms ruled over by a Muslim dynasty. They began to decline after a major defeat at the Battle of Talikota in 1565. The empire eventually collapsed in 1614, and all their glory had been erased by 1646. Thanks for watching! Which of these ancient civilizations is your favorite? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already! See you soon for another video on ancient history! Bye!